So today I'm here with Kylie Milliken and Melissa Wood. They are the director and production team of Billion Dollar Bully. It is a Yelp documentary going into their business practices. It speaks with ex-employees. It speaks with business owners that have had to deal with them amongst, uh, and it just really digs in in a great way. So just, uh, I know that you two are very busy since you've got a premiere coming up in the next few months. So thank you very much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for the for being willing to speak with us about it. Course, okay, so yeah. The, yeah, my first main question before we get into anything else is just can you give can you give us any idea what got two people so aggravated about or incentivized about Yelp to do a crowdfunding project and then spend two to three years of their life traveling the uh, the country to interview people and turn it into a documentary? Like what what was it that got you two uh, that involved in this, or that was that motivating? <laughs> Yeah, well, Yelp is a service that I had used as a consumer many times. I went on there to find businesses without a second thought about it. And it wasn't until I was at my doctor's and she began to tell me about her experiences with Yelp. And I was really surprised about what she said. It sounded, the practices that Yelp was using sounded illegal. And I didn't understand how this company was getting away with it if what she was saying was true. So I went home and I began researching it and I just found thousands and thousands of stories all saying the same thing. And I thought, okay, well, this is coming from a business owner's perspective. What is Yelp's response to this? And anytime they are questioned at all, they always, first of all, they try to smear the person questioning them, which doesn't seem great. And then secondly, they jump to three areas. They say there was a Harvard business study that shows we do nothing wrong. The FTC closed an investigation without taking action and court cases have all been dismissed. And those all sound really good. So I, the first thing I did was look at the Harvard business study and it was full of holes. I was really surprised and I thought, okay, if, um, if this is what they use as their big ammo to show people that they are a clean company, then there's something else going on here. And I got together with Melissa and we thought that this was a really important story to tell because so many consumers like ourselves would rely on Yelp thinking that they we're an altruistic company and thousands of businesses have suffered at the hands of Yelp. And so we really want to be able to help share their stories. What are some of the holes that you found in these studies? Because I remember I saw an interview with you on CNBC with Shannon. I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name there, but uh, she ha- she was talking about these studies that were done. And y- what were the holes that you found in those studies? So God, it, it goes back to, um, First of all, it's a very limited study. It it only examines restaurants and only in Boston. And basically what the study says is um, r- restaurants with lower ratings are more likely to try to get false ads or I'm sorry, false reviews on their page. Um, and also chain restaurants are less likely to try to get um, false reviews. And that's really all it said. It really didn't get into the stuff that Yelp kind of claims it says. It doesn't, um, the authors of the study actually say that they don't know how the algorithm works. They can only make guesses, but they don't know. Uh, So yeah, it it just, it didn't say what Yelp kind of tries to claim it says. Yeah, and what I found particularly interesting is that in that interview, she said in a very wise-ass tone, yeah, we're all just part of somebody's fundraising project because like, that's all they're doing here is they're just trying to raise money. And she said it with this sense that you should feel such shame that you raised $90,000 over three years to pay four or five people to work full-time on this and travel around the country, which is really interesting projection when they have sales agents that cold call people on a regular basis every day, asking them to pay $2,300 or $2,200 a month for these packages. Everybody that has funded you, from my knowledge, from the Kickstarter campaign that I linked below, uh, found you voluntarily and paid you voluntarily, whereas their methods of advertising are to cold call you to essentially fundraise. So she was shaming you for doing the same thing that they're doing on a regular basis. And for those of you who haven't followed my story since this was a long time ago in 2015, back when the channel had like 10,000 subscribers, I, had a, I was getting calls about once a month from a sales agent for, at that point, about six or seven years. And I had always said no. And I got sick and tired of it. So one of the sales agents had given personal back-end information of one of my competitors. And I thought, hmm, you're probably not supposed to be sending me this. And they got in trouble for it. 
Right after the sales agent got in trouble for that, I got a one-star review from somebody in Chicago who said that they had walked into the store and they walked into the store and they had this terrible experience. We gave them the machine back in pieces and it was in, uh, and we had, because we didn't have a part in stock. So I look and I see that we have over a hundred of that part in stock. Your name's not in our system and you said you walked here? That, that, that's a really long walk from Chicago. So I thought this was kind of fishy. And when I wind up Googling them, I realized that that person that left me the one-star review was best friends with the sales agent that got in trouble. They were friend, they were they were in the same graduating class on LinkedIn. They were friends on Yelp, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Google Plus, every and as soon as I pointed that out to Yelp, they immediately just deleted this person's account. They had hundreds of hundreds of reviews and just decided to uh, completely delete it. And I thought that was that was particularly interesting. And that was when I, when we met. Yeah, what was interesting about that as well is sending those backend stats, I found, is very common practice. They do it all the time. Yet, when it happened with you and it, your video kind of went viral, um, they let her go. So, it was, it was kind of, it seemed like they were trying to save face by letting her go, yet they encouraged that behavior all the time. Yeah. That's common now- practice. Okay, so now some of the uh, the questions that I had for you. So the the first is, um, what you ha- have there been any revelations or surprises that you weren't expecting to find in interviewing the actual employees? Um, yes, I think <laughs> we're we're trying not to give away too much, but I, could, I, um, I think every time somebody came um, or initially came forward with a story, we were shocked that the of, of the details they, that they were providing us and the um, backup they had to the story, we could not believe it. And as time has gone by over the course of two or three years now that we've been doing it, I think we're less shocked because we keep hearing the same story over and over um, of what Yelp's doing to their business. But initially, I think we were both completely surprised of, about what was happening um, without getting into details about certain or specific okay. stories. Now, one of the things I've been trying to envision how this could possibly happen, particularly with a publicly traded company, and it's very difficult for me to buy into the idea that at a publicly traded multi-billion dollar company, that it says somewhere in their guide, like they have this little mafia handbook that tells you when they decide not to sign up, here's the button that you click to make all their negative reviews show up. And the reason that I find it hard to believe that there's some sort of real scandal within Yelp is because as a publicly traded company, if I work there and I make $40,000 a year, my loyalty is not to the, comp- to the company that's mismanaged paying me $40,000 a year. My loyalty would be to the law firm or to Fox News who wants to pay me $250,000 to bring them this document and tell my story. So it was difficult for me to buy into the idea that that's the way that this was, that this was happening. So do you think that this is more of a rules issue within Yelp? Or do you think it's like a company culture run amok? So, you know, for, it's or, definitely, sorry, it's definitely company culture. It's this whole frat boy mentality when they go there. So many of these sales employees are fresh out of college. It's one of their first jobs and they're just there to have a good time. And it's, it's one of the ex-employees we spoke with talked about FOMO, fear of missing out. And uh, if you weren't going out all the time with your coworkers and you were missing out on this and that, and there were a number of employees that would not go on camera with us. Um, they sign NDAs when they leave the company. And they, um, they said, yeah, if we weren't going out, it was kind of, it was frowned upon. And, um, and, and really the sales employees don't have, a, it, 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 they're bottom feeders at the company. It's <laughs> the upper management that's um, more responsible for how things go there. And yeah, I, it, it, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think that without getting to the bottom of how, how is this corruption happening, um, because they won't release their algorithm, so nobody really knows how it's going on. Um, we just know that thousands of business owners are saying the same thing. They have the same um, documentation to back it up. And um, there has to be something behind what's going on. Yeah, because what and, I was imagining... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Well, and there's not just one thing that's going on with the company. That's part of creating this film. It was so hard to figure out how to piece it together because there are so many rabbit holes it could go down. And even as we have it now, it's like, ah, we, we couldn't bring this and this and this up, but it's, so it's not one, only one thing that the company is doing. It's numerous things and it's, well, the fact that it, it portrays itself as um, just a platform for which people can write reviews and look at reviews is wrong because they're not that type of a company. They're, um, they're an advertising company. They make their uh, money off of small, co- small businesses advertising with them. Yeah, and because when I look, with just look at my example, it's difficult for me to believe that it was in the document saying, you know, like, let this per give this person a one star if they don't sign up. What I most likely imagined was that, you know, er- Erica went out with her friend that evening for drinks. They said, how was your day? And it's like, oh, I got in trouble after calling this asshole customer that didn't want to sign up. And she's like, what's his name? And he's like, this is his name. He has some business in New York. And they're like, and then they just move on to something else. And then the next day I get a one star review. And at the office, nobody notices or cares. And Eli, the computer guy, who has a really good channel, he's been mentioning for years that a lot of modern startups they, they really want you to go out after work. They really want you to go out drinking. They really want you to be friends. They have this, oh, you know, uh, drinks on tap at the office kind of environment, which he thinks is terrible. And I kind of thought about that when you said that they have this culture of going out and, and uh, doing things together and they're right out of college and FOMO and all that. It seems like a lot of that startup culture is what's involved here. Or yeah, that, sure. that type of culture is involved in, in, in this type of scandal. And it's why it's so difficult to pinpoint it because you can't really prove that it's in a rule book when it's in this unwritten rules of the company culture. Right, exactly. But I think that it would be wrong to blame the salespeople because they are doing their job. I think this is so much bigger than that. This is upper management um, that's trickling down to the salespeople that are having to pull the trigger on the things that, you know, that they're doing. So definitely the culture that's, happening at Yelp or that we believe to be happening at Yelp, I'm sure contributes to it, but I think it's so much deeper than that. Well, essentially, how do you indict a culture rather than a rule set? And if and to what degree is management or company owners responsible for the company culture? Because I know, for example, at my business, if I hear that somebody wanted, you know, didn't want to pay for something and I hear somebody say, all right, you know, like 20 volts to that it goes, and the person was really nice and kind. Like, I can overhear that, and I can say I didn't hear it. I can hear it and make a comment right there. And it's really difficult to make a comment in that moment to indict a negative part of a company culture, partially because you have to make a confrontation, but also partially because it's so easy to just pretend it didn't happen. So how do you, how do you indict uh, negative aspects of a company culture and hold management responsible for that? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I think management is always responsible for what's going on um, with their subordinates. Um, Having said that, I don't think that's the crux of the problem. I think it's so much bigger than that. I think when you have thousands of business owners coming forward saying, when I refuse to advertise, all of my good reviews were filtered and all of my bad ones, even if they were from three or four years ago, are now put at the top. And if that's happening over and over and over and over again, is that just something that we can blame on a culture within the company or is that now a policy? I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear what business owners are saying and the information that they're bringing, bringing to our attention. But it would, I would also add that it would serve a company well to listen to Okay, this is one thing I just find so ironic is Yelp, they tell these business owners all the time, if you're not happy with your reviews, speak to your customers and try to make things right. If you have a two-star review, reach out to them. Try to bump that up to a five-star review. Speak to your customers. Yelp's customers are these business owners, and they are completely turning a deaf ear to any complaints a business owner has. And any time... from everything I have seen, any time a business owner goes to Yelp and says, I'm having this problem because of this, they're like, well, just do a better job being a business owner. And those are their customers. So they refuse to follow their own advice. Well, right, so- and, and, you know, they don't respect their customer when the customer says, okay, well, I'd like to be taken off Yelp. I'd like my business to be taken off Yelp. And they can't do that. There, there's well, no way to take your business off of Yelp. 
Okay, so now that, that brings me to one of my next questions. So in my business, I, one of the reasons I was skeptical of this in the beginning was I would read through some of these Facebook groups and I would read posts from people in my business saying, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here obviously for, for comedic effect, but it would say something like, we charged the customer $20 more than the manufacturer and installed a knockoff part and they left a two-star review. We hate Yelp. And I would read so much of this stuff that was just from people where I just wanted to facepalm and go, it, this is not Yelp. It's not the customer. It's that you suck at running a business. So there are people who are going to see that these Yelp scams. They're going to see the businesses that complain about it. They're going to see a documentary film dedicated to it. How is how do you separate out the people that have genuinely been screwed or wronged in some way from people that just don't know how to run a business and want to scapegoat the platform upon which their unhappy customers leave bad reviews? Well, yeah, that's I, what took us so long because we we had to do research when people came forward and brought us their story. Um, we had to vet them and and what they were saying. Sorry, Kaylee, I interrupted you, but oh, no, it's fine. Um, it just it, it's a very valid point that there are a lot of business owners who are just really bad at running their business. Um, it, it's interesting. We the um, there are people who they they're just so leave us the most rude comments. And it's kind of these same people who just tend to, they can't run their own business very well. But I think the stories that we have are very solid. Um, It's not, uh, they're people who have been running their company for a long while. They know what they're doing and it's, they just have been hit hard with Yelp. Okay, now another question. When it comes, a lot of the the criticism around Yelp has to do with their algorithm that they use for filtering reviews. And part of I part of what I feel is is causing a lot of this criticism is that they're one of the first companies, at least that I know of, one of the only major review company that has even attempted to create an algorithm for reviews. So, you know, if well, one example of something that happened to me Reese, uh, about a year or two ago is we had done a repair for somebody. There, you know, it was unfixable. So since they were seemed like a nice person, we said we're just going to replace this with something that we have, and you know that would be the altruistic thing to do. So they save money. They saw it in a paranoid way of, oh my God, they swapped it because they took my stuff. And that now the next day we had five or six one star reviews on Facebook, and it was all that person's friends. And those reviews have stuck to this day, even though that person's five or six friends are not customers of our business because Facebook, unlike Yelp, has no algorithm where it tries to figure out, are you a legitimate review or are you just six of a person's friend leaving a review? Yelp has this algorithm where based on engagements, location, how many times you search for a business, how often you use the platform, it tries to guess, is this real or not? And that's gotten them a lot of trouble. But it's also been a godsend to a lot of businesses that have... um, that are sick and tired of the city search method. You know, like if I don't like my friend that has Simple Mac as a business, I can sit here and in the time it took to do this interview, I can sign up for 10 city search accounts and leave them 10 one star reviews and they're not going to get removed. So, do you think that there is room within the Yelp algorithm and the Yelp system for it to be conducted in a, a more moral way? Or do you think it, you just need to do away with this whole system because it's too open to corruption? And I think that Yelp could do a few things that would make them a much better company. Um, From what I have seen, the CEO seems extremely arrogant and refuses to listen to any kind of suggestions. But yes, there are a few things they could do uh, to really change their company around. Yeah, I mean, I think in theory, the algorithm that they say is supposed to weed out people that are leaving reviews that are not legitimate in theory is really great. Um, but we're seeing in practice, maybe that's that the algorithm is failing a lot of business owners. And so if as a company, that is your main objective is that you've created this algorithm to help businesses. Then when they come forward in by the thousands and they're saying, this isn't helping me, this is hurting me. Why would you not go drop back to the drawing board and make a, something different? Um, that's that's how I see the algorithm. Hmm. All right. Now another one is uh. So there, is you. I think when did you start filming this documentary? In two thousand fifteen. All right. So the, now I've been reading up and I've been trying to read up on the new comments since uh, we we last spoke in two thousand fifteen. And there are some people that have been saying, "Why does it take so long to film this? Why hasn't it been released yet?" And so on and so forth. And then I started reading some of just some of the hoops that you had to jump through to even release a professional film, like in sh- 
you had it, you have to get insurance, you have to speak to law firms. So for those of us who just think that releasing a documentary is hitting record in the camera and hitting upload on YouTube, can you explain to us uh, what you have to go through besides those two steps that has lengthened the process unexpectedly for you? Sure. We, I mean, Kaylee can, so, sorry, was I talking over you? <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, I think it's part of the reason that it's taken us several years to finish uh, the film is there's definitely different reasons, but one of them was that when we first started digging into this story, we had absolutely no idea how huge this was. And so it kept pushing back our deadline. Every time we thought, okay, we're ready to go into post-production, we would have another story that would come to our attention. And we were like, this needs to be part of the documentary. Including so you, Lewis. <laughs> that was, yeah. that was pretty it. late in the game. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that, that would push our deadline back. And then there were aspects of um, feeling like this is such a big responsibility that we have and we don't take it lightly to get tell the story right. So we would go back to the drawing board and say, is this right? Is this right? And so, you know, that did, that did delay us. Um, also the insurance was a huge, a huge undertaking. Um, it, so yeah, what, you know, can you just explain the insurance part? Because I don't think a lot of people even understand the concept of having insurance for a documentary. And that yeah. would, that would cut down on, I think a lot of the people complaining about the amount of time that it takes to release this, something like this. Well, every film requires E&O insurance, which is errors and emissions insurance. Um, you have to get that before you show a film. And it usually takes about three to five days to get, and it costs around $5,000. So I kind of figured it would be a, about that. Part of this, the fact that no insurance broker or attorney wants to be involved with the movie against a multi-billion dollar company. It's not the attorneys, because the attorneys know that we're pretty legally sound. It's the insurance companies, because as one of them said, this is a company you're going up against that has shown themselves to be very litigious and they, um, they can likely sue. Um, it doesn't matter if they have grounds or not. Okay. So were there any concerns that you would be, uh, ground down by, by, you know, just legal paperwork and just having to show up in court and the amount, uh, prior to filming? Like, did, did they ever send you any sort of cease and desist or wanting to oh, go did anything like that? Yeah. No, I think it would look. I think it would reflect pretty badly on them if they were going to do that, given that they are um, all about freedom of speech. You did get the vice president of uh, commercial relations or something to show up on CNBC, which was interesting. <laughs> I don't think I could get the vice president of a publicly traded company to show up on a on the news. We also about. got an email from Jeremy Stoppelman himself. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, declining to be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that he, our, he did answer our email. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see what um, I, I've got some questions from the audience that would be interesting to read here. So if anybody has questions, the YouTube and Twitch chat are open. Let's see. Would you be Jessa Jones says? Would you be able to differentiate someone who worked for Yelp from someone who worked for, for the mafia in a phone call? <laughs> Asking trolling questions. <laughs> Uh, is this not similar to the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal? Most likely starts with a CEO memo and then it's part of the company policy or culture. That's something Kaylee and I were just discussing last night. Um, how relevant this topic that we're working on, this, this subject that we're working on now is now becoming with all the things that are going on in the news with Facebook and things like that. Um, Kaylee? Yeah, ditto to what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, when a business can't take themselves off of a platform that they don't want to be on, their information is now being used against their will. They're, they're no longer in control of their own um, stuff, right? They're not in control of the address that's being put on there. They're not, not in control of anything. So um, it's interesting how... The, the business owners have come forward and said their 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 information is being held hostage, essentially. Well, one one of the questions I have there is essentially what legal precedent would there be to not have someone's information on a website? So, for example, if if somebody wanted to host a site that said Rossman Repair Group, one eighty six First Avenue, and from a freedom of speech perspective, what right would I have to tell them that they're not allowed to do that? You know, so there's this. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there now that do um, 
online reputation management and they try to help businesses who have bad online reputations, bring them up. Um, and we interviewed one company that they never claimed they worked for Yelp. They never said they had any kind of affiliation with Yelp and Yelp sued them for um, a whole slew of things, but ended up saying, okay, well, we're suing you for copyright infringement because on their website, that was um, Yelp symbol was one of the ones they used saying like, we can help you out on, you know, Facebook, Google reviews, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and Yelp was just one of many that were there. And so it's interesting that Yelp really is picky about where they are placed, um, yet they are um, f- putting up companies themselves on okay, to Yelp. So, so was their page. argument that you're using my logo, which is my copyright against my will? Yeah. Huh. So, so, that, so what if, so if, if, if let's say Yelp just listed the text of your business uh, without a logo, and I'm just, I'm, I don't see how that would be something that could be taken down. I understand how business owners would not want to be listed on the site, but at the same time, I, th- I think it would create some sort of dangerous precedent to say, you know, you have the right to take a, na- a business's name down from a website. Yeah, but the problem is they, it, the business owner doesn't necessarily put themselves up there. Anybody can put any business up there. And then you start getting these phone calls from Yelp saying you need to claim your business page. You need to claim your business page. It's free. Claim your business page. You can't change any information. And if you don't do it, anybody else can. And they can put any information about your business that they want there. So then you go and claim your free business page. But by claiming it, you have to click OK to their terms of service. And you have just entered your first contract with Yelp. Okay, so and essentially now, you're saying you would have to enter a contract in order to correct false information about you on the internet. Sure. Right, yeah. So that's a decent argument. I have one person here saying, I'm an ex-Yelp employee. You're 100% correct on flat, frat culture. Uh, not on review conspiracy. People are explicitly fired if they infer a correlation between reviews and ads. I would be curious if it was kind of like a winking agreement, though. Let's see, what else do we have in questions? Yeah. All right. Time is. If you are on a business trip in New York and want oh, if you are on a business trip in New York City and want Thai food, would you secretly check Yelp to find the best place to go? If not, how would you find a place? No, no, I would not. Um, I have friends in New York, so I'd probably ask them. <laughs> okay, but for someone who doesn't, I. You can TripAdvisor is what I use. TripAdvisor, yeah, there are businesses that have their issues with it, but you can um, go on. Usually, a lot of restaurants have different Instagram accounts. You can see if, oh, yeah, that looks good. Or um, people who, I hate to use this word, but foodies who um, like to post photos all the time about places they've gone. You can actually find some really good places through that. Um, No, I would not secretly check Yelp, but I will say that. Anytime you do a search for a restaurant, any business, but a restaurant specifically, the first usually 10 things you see are Yelp. And you can't help but kind of get this bias feeling when without even clicking on the link, you see that they have a two-star rating. So I, I definitely have to watch myself on that. Did you have any issues with any employees that had signed an NDA in terms of them being able to speak, uh, speak with you? Um, <laughs> there was one employee that we were going to speak with, had everything set up. She was flying out from New York. Our cinematographer was flying up from LA. Every, everything was set up and she got to the airport and she's, she said, I can't get on the plane. I, I'm so worried about them coming after me because of that NDA I signed. Yeah, I've I've dealt with NDAs before. I had an employee that had signed an NDA and it said something about the same position. So when I hired him, I had to put him on payroll as a janitor, so that it would, <laughs> that was. So it's 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 sometimes very tricky to try to get around NDAs. But hopefully, I imagine Yelps are better written than those for the places I've hired. They're intimidating, especially for somebody who is making forty thousand a forty thousand dollars a year and can't afford to have an attorney go and check things for them. Have you seen any stories of people claiming a business page and then trying to sell it to the actual business? I have not seen that. That is interesting. I would hope that Yelp would get on that, but I don't know. I I would hope Yelp would do a lot of things that they're not doing. I don't think we've heard about that. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So, I've but looked. they may have a new scheme there. <laughs> Looks like we're almost to the end of questions. And uh, now, wh- wh- when is the uh, when is this documentary going to be coming out? Do you have any uh, specific time for a premiere or for a release for those who are interested or want to see it? Yeah, we um, soon. In the coming weeks, uh, we're going to be having a buyer's screening that's going to be taking place in Hollywood. Um, and then after that, everything will be coming together and this will be in front of an audience and hopefully it will be changing Yelp's business practices. Do you think a business model like Yelp's can actually work where they can provide an unbiased service? I would think so. Yelp has started to find ways to make money aside from business owners, you know, with um, some of their online reservation stuff. But uh, they're still the vast majority of their money comes from business owners. Um, so uh, that just represents a huge conflict of interest. All right, so if people wanted to help you and contribute to what you're doing, uh, where else bes- uh, can they find you besides uh, prostfilms.com? That's by the P-R-O-S-T F-I-L-M-S dot com. So where, where can people find you? How can they help you out if this is something that th- they're interested in being involved in or just interested in you know, helping move the process along? Yeah, it's also on Facebook. Um, really, those are the only two spots right now uh, until we get things released. Yeah. All right. So I um, guess that's about it. So uh, thank okay. you very much for taking the time today. Anything else you want to say? Yep. Or- no, thanks for your time, guys. Yeah. All right.